uh, this is the latest in a series of Cornerstone's uh, presentation reviewing the data that's been presented at the Congresses. Um, unlike the best of DDW, this is not going to be an in-depth review of every abstract in IBD presented at UEG and ACG. This is very much a uh, curated selection uh, of the clinical trials that were presented, and those were chosen by the faculty, and that's myself and Peter and Marla and David Rubin from the US, uh, and we're very grateful to them and to the uh, video presenters who have recorded uh, some uh, segments of uh, the relevant trial presentations, uh, just as a break from Pete and me speaking. Uh, of course, this is a industry-funded exercise, and we have unrestricted educational grants from Abvi, Bristol Myers Squibb, Celtry on Galapagos Janssen, Pfizer, Takeda, and Tillets. Um, none of them had any input into the preparation of the slides or the selection of the presentations that we are uh, doing today. And these are the disclosures of ourselves uh, and our colleagues in the faculty and the video presenters. And of course, this will be on the handout uh, if you want to peruse in a little bit more detail. Um, first of all, let's just take a stock of, of where we are and what the kind of uh, 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 pathways that we're going to be discussing, uh, what they're inhibited. And this is one of those sort of complex diagrams of the uh, mucosal immune system. And I'm just going to briefly run through some of the relevant pathways uh, and then we'll discuss where the drugs interrupt. Of course, you know, one of the first issues is a slightly leaky epithelium, reduced barrier layer. And then you get interaction between aspects of the uh, microbiota and its its antigenic load with the innate immune system, monocytes and macrophages. And in IBD, that's thought to be slightly defective, allowing antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, to uh, uh, present uh, the bacterial antigen to naive T cells, which then differentiate into a range of uh, effector phenotypes. And in inflammatory bowel disease, the presence of IL-12 uh, drives them towards TH1, IL-23 and TGF-beta towards TH17. And there's a reduction uh, in the generation of regulatory T cells. The vast majority of that happens in the draining mesenteric lymph nodes. Uh, and those uh, now newly differentiated effector lymphocytes migrate out of the, uh, the, the, the mesenteric lymph nodes along a gradient of a chemical called uh, sphingosine 1,5-phosphate. Uh, and then they go back into the circulation where they can traffic back to the gut, uh, driven by interaction of alpha-4-beta-7 uh, with the vascular address in MADCAM and VCAM. And then when in the lamina propria, these now activated effector uh, memory lymphocytes drive inflammation with the release of a whole range of different cytokines, including TNF, IL-17, interferon gamma. And that then has a feedback loop, uh, increasing proliferation, and that signaling is all through the JAK stat pathway. And then with that sort of summary, you can see where the drugs that we're very familiar with, the anti-TNFs act, they uh, uh, neutralize soluble TNF, they uh, neutralize membrane-bound TNF, and they cause apoptosis in the cells expressing TNF. Uh, the drugs such as uh, etralizumab, natalizumab, and vedolizumab, anti-integrins, block the trafficking uh, of leukocytes back into the lamina propria. Erstikinumab and anti-P40 blocks IL-12 and IL-23 signaling, reducing differentiation to Th1 and Th17 effector memory lymphocytes, as well as impacting uh, on uh, uh, the circulating lamina propria cytokine. The more specific uh, anti-P19s uh, are focused on IL-23 uh, and the differentiation and function of Th17 cells. Um, I've lost where that's gone, but I'm hoping it's gone to azanamod and atrazamod, which are the sphingosine 1,5 modulators, and they impact that process by which effector memory lymphocytes egress uh, from the uh, draining mesenteric lymph nodes. And finally, uh, we have the JAK inhibitors, which impact JAK stat signaling. And we're going to be discussing drugs from every one of these classes over the course of the next 60-odd uh, uh, minutes. Um, this is really just to highlight that 
Uh, there are more and more of the, the drugs that we know are currently licensed. Azanamod, the first S1P receptor modulator, is, is now licensed for osteoclitis in the USA. Uh, and, and we're expecting uh, other drugs, and we'll highlight that through the presentation uh, in, in, in the course of the next year. And of course, outside of inflammatory bowel disease, many of these agents have uh, uh, indications, license indications for other autoimmune diseases. I'm going to take this opportunity uh, to pass on to Pete, who's going to tell us a little bit about some of the new data uh, from the Seaview trial. Did you mention questions? I That's think I, I think I said oh, in fine. the, in good, the good. questioning thing. Lovely, right? Okay. Uh, so um, we're going to we're going to start off by looking at the sort of uh, uh, the P40 axis, if you like. Uh, so uh, many of you will have seen earlier this year. Uh, the release of the Seaview study, which was the first biologic head-to-head -head trial in Crohn's disease comparing adalimumab uh, and ustekinumab in people with moderate to severe biologic naive uh, uh, Crohn's disease. This is the study design. Uh, you can see that people were randomized to receive either standard induction with ustekinumab uh, or adalimumab. Uh, and then uh, uh, ongoing maintenance with uh, with those drugs as well at the standard doses, standard US doses, uh, it must be noted here. I've just noted there's a bit of a blank bit in the middle at the top of the slide there. Uh, what's missing there are the, are the dummy injections because there were dummy injections and infusions uh, so, that, uh, uh, so that the patients didn't know uh, whether they were receiving astekinumab or adalimumab and it was a treat through design uh, so patients received the same drug all the way through to week 52, uh, which was the primary endpoint, which was clinical remission. Uh, so let's just remind ourselves of the outcome. Uh, it was a superiority study. It was powered to show that astekinumab was superior to adalimumab. Uh, and as you can see, it did not meet its primary endpoint. Uh, uh, ustekinumab uh, uh, resulted in clinical remission in about 65% of patients compared with 61% of adalimumab treated patients. Now, if we're going to be strict, we can't say anything about equivalence because one would have had to have done a non-equivalent uh, powered study to show that, although I think you can infer what you like uh, from uh, uh, from uh, the uh, proportions of patients who met the primary endpoint. But I think, Pete, it's fair to say on this, these are quite encouraging results because it, these is not randomised responders. So this is all comers started with drug, 65% in remission at the end of one year. That's probably better than the phase three data, isn't it? Probably, definitely. Probably, yeah. a, you know, better than many of the things. And in fact, and, and, and in fact, if we look at the endoscopic response as well, and again, you'll see that there's not much difference here between uh, ustekinumab and adalimumab. And this is one of the things I really liked about Seaview, the fact that there was some robust endoscopic assessment, which we haven't really seen with ustekinumab before. So absolutely. And, and just to go back to that sort of randomized responder mm. uh, type thing. Now, it, you, you can do a slightly cheaty type. It's not really cheaty. You can do an analysis where you look at the patient's who at the end of induction uh, have responded and therefore in a randomized responder study would have gone on to be re-randomized and then you can start to look at what proportion of patients had you followed that design would have come out oh, with yeah. response yeah, yeah. at about week 52 and you're up at sort of 80 85 even i think with us to get about close to 90 yeah. percent not remission but response so, at week 52. So what was the difference between these people and the people in the original phase three trials? And to be fair, the phase three trials for Adelman as well, because CHARM, which was the, 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 you know, the classic trials, didn't show this kind of response or remission, or remission rates, did they? No, I think, I think one has to be realistic about the patients. They're relatively treatment naive, yeah. okay? So they've got short disease duration. They are by definition biologic naive as yeah. well, of course, which was not the case for most of the uh, of the registration studies, at least for a proportion of patients. And if you actually look at the SESCD scores, the endoscopic scores, uh, you'll see that they're probably a slightly less severe population than that which we see. So I think the the uh, median uh, SESCD score was sitting up at around eight or something. If you look at the the big RCTs, uh, then it tends to be more about 12 or something. Yeah. So, so but a less severe had, population. But they still had endoscopically active disease. And they still had uh, they still had a CDAI of 220 yeah. Uh, to yeah. 450. Uh, 
uh, one final point before we, we, we move on from here is I think what it reminds us is if you treat Crohn's disease early in a naive population, the drugs work well. Yeah. And, and clearly, Seaview shows that both these drugs work well. So what was new at UEG? I, sorry to have represented that, but I think it is such a, you know, it, it, it's a good trial and it tells us some important things. What was new? Well, we got some, uh, we got some quality of life data. This is the PROMISE 29 data. PROMISE stands for something like patient reported outcome measures, uh, something, a measurement tool or something, I can't quite remember, instrument assessment or something. Anyway, it's a way of looking at a variety uh, of quality of life measures, a bit like IBDQ does as well. And you can see them listed on the screen here, physical function, sleep disturbance, uh, fatigue, depression, anxiety, etc. cetera. Uh, pain intensity is measured in a slightly different way uh, from the others. Uh, and, and, and what they do is, for the dark blue ones, they, they measure this thing called a T-score, which is based on the average uh, quality of life measures from a group of healthy people, uh, whereas the pain intensity score is simply a, a zero to 10 rating. And so they have validated measures of a significant change in each of these scores. Uh, and if we look over onto the next slide, I think, yes, here we go. We can look at the proportion of patients who have a significant improvement in, in each of these domains at week 52. And I think you can probably see fairly clearly there again, perhaps unsurprisingly, given what we've seen, that there's no massive difference between the two drugs. But I think we can take more away from this, can't we? So we can take away the fact that fatigue seems to improve. Uh, 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 as you look over on the top right hand side of, uh, uh, of the slide there, you see that something like half of the patients or slightly more had an improvement in fatigue. Uh, I, I think these p-values uh, uh, are all nominal, so uh, don't read too much into them. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, patients do respond in terms of fatigue when it comes to treating their disease. Uh, their depression and anxiety gets a bit better as well, uh, even sleep disturbance. So, uh, so you know, some of these things that we care about but probably don't measure very well seem to respond to treatment. Hmm. I think there's a caveat. This is not a placebo controlled study and many of these things will have a significant placebo response. Uh, so uh, so what we can't do here is compare, you know, what it would have been like if the patients had been having placebo. It's still interesting, uh, interesting in itself. Uh, 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 these are uh, changes from baseline, as you can see, over time from uh, from week zero through to uh, through to week 52. In fact, what they what uh, it, it, what they don't show very clearly, of course, is uh, <laughs> is that the line should start at zero actually from week zero, so you can see the change over mm. time. So it looks like there's not much change, but in fact, what I think we see mostly is that you get a lot of early change and not much late change. And in fact, if you look at the disease activity scores in uh, in Seaview, you'll see that you get a lot of change early, not too much from week 16 onwards, although you still recapture a bit more. Then the final thing from Seaview uh, is the PK analysis, which I'm just going to show you here. Um, so this is looking at quartiles of uh, drug concentration uh, at week 52 compared with clinical remission at week 52. And what we see here is very little relationship between the two. Now, we've seen that before with the stokinumab. With adalimumab, actually, uh, I think in the past we have seen uh, a uh, exposure efficacy uh, relationship uh, more clearly than this, but we don't see it here. Um, uh, 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 I think it is worth looking out for the serene data, uh, which is the high dose adalimumab study in UC and Crohn's disease for PK and we'll learn more from that but that's not going to be out until UEG next year. So not much in terms of clinical but when you start to go look at endoscopic you are starting to see an exposure uh, efficacy response here. Again we saw this with ustekinumab in, in Stardust. When you looked at the harder end points you saw a relationship between. Also, you saw it in the analysis of the endoscopic endpoints from the uh, immunity trial. You did. In that it was only it was only for endoscopic endpoints that you saw a benefit of eight weekly dosing over twelve weekly dosing, suggesting that you really there's more of a dose response, I guess, for the endoscopic endpoints, which which makes sense. 
and we see it here for adalimumab yeah. as well. And then the other thing, of course, that's very interesting is immunogenicity. Now, uh, we should point out here that uh, at CVU, at the start of CVU, you had to stop your concomitant immunomodulation. We know that adalimumab creates antibodies, uh, and we see here that in fact most patients uh, developed antibodies. Bear in mind, of course, this is a drug tolerant assay. So, uh, and most of these antibodies are actually very low titer, less than one in eight. Yeah. Um, uh, it's quite a stark message, isn't it? Yes, it, it, it is stark. I think because so many patients got antibodies, there wasn't really a relationship between antibodies and yeah. outcome. I mean, it might be quite interesting to look to see rather than, you know, these, as you say, a lot of these would have been low titer. You, it might be quite interesting to look at antibodies that were associated with low or undetectable yeah. levels and see what, because the percentage would obviously be lower with those. Right. And uh, and in fact, when you do look at those pe uh, people with high uh, uh, titer antibodies, of course, they tend to have low drug levels. And, uh, and, and yeah. uh, the trouble is the numbers start getting very low at that point but what you can also clearly hear uh, see yeah. here is us to get him up does not cause antibodies fascinating yeah. really isn't yeah, it it is, it is really absolutely low. fascinating uh, which we see with some of the other newer biologics uh, uh, as well um, uh, and then I'm just going to finish off this segment by uh, by talking briefly about ustekinumab. Now, it, this is this is long-term data from Unify, I think. Yes, it is. Now that's the ulcerative colitis study, but I'm not really uh, I'm not really showing you the data uh, uh, in a disease-specific way because I think the things that I want to uh, that I want to show you here uh, is about what happens to the long-term uh, uh, to the long-term outcomes with the patients. Uh, that stay in and go into the open label extension. That's the data we're looking at here. And what you can probably see here, in fact, whether you look at non-responder imputation, which of course is, a, is a, a more robust way, if you like, a harsher way of looking at outcomes, you see here that in fact, ustekinumab does rather well over time. There's not much drop off. And I think that's one of the things that we haven't really talked about yet uh, this evening, but in Seaview, what you did see was that the adalimumab patients started dropping off towards the end and you didn't see it with ustekinumab. I guess that probably fits with immunogenicity as much and as good, anything. Yeah, very good persistence here in UC. Right, yeah. So uh, uh, so I think that is the end of the uh, segment. Oh, sorry, no, corticosteroid free remission, uh, uh, we have some data for here. And we can see, in fact, not just that corticosteroid free remission uh, was actually seen in the vast majority of patients, but perhaps not surprisingly that those patients who'd failed biologics fared rather worse than the patients who were who were biologic uh, naive. Uh, and then if we look at some of the harder endpoints uh, like CRP and calprotectin, uh, you know, we see uh, we see robust responses there, which rather fits nicely, I think, with yeah. the with the symptomatic benefit we see. So there is one question for oh, you. Oh, good, you've got it, thank uh, you. And, and it was about the T-scores in the PROMISE uh, aspect. And the question was, was it only in responders that you saw, a clinical responders, that you saw an improvement in all those other aspects of quality of life? Or would there have been patients who, who in whom the other aspects of quality of life improved? It's actually a really neat question from Vasu uh, from Newham. Yeah. Thanks, Vasu, and I can confidently say I don't know the answer to that. I could, I could, can, I could uh, uh, have a guess in that I think there'll be a mix, but I think in general, you, uh, I suspect they were more likely to occur as logically in the patients who responded. But it is a good question, and uh, we might ask uh, Janssen about that at some point. So now I'm going to go on and talk about some of the risankizumab data. As mentioned, risankizumab is the ABV anti P19. Oh gosh, that's wrong. Uh, it, it says IL-1223, and it shouldn't. It should just be uh, an IL-23 inhibitor. Yes. We'll change that for the next presentation. Uh, and there are a series of abstracts here uh, presented uh, looking at uh, induction response depending on the number of previous biologics, uh, looking at the speed of response, the impact of an additional 12 weeks of uh, uh, induction therapy in those who didn't meet the initial response criteria, and finally, uh, the maintenance data. So um, just to remind you, uh, the risankizumab, and just to stress again, that's an uh, anti-P19, uh, anti-IL-23 agent trial design, had two almost identical induction studies where patients 
patients were randomized to either placebo or one or two doses of rizinkizumab administered intravenously. The difference between them was that the advanced study include biologic naive as well as biologic exposed patients, whereas the motivate study uh, another induction study only included uh, those who had previously had inadequate response to biologics. Those who responded went into the maintenance study, Fortify, and we'll hear about that in just a little bit. And those that did not have an adequate response at the end of the 12 week induction study were able to enter a re induction period. And then those that responded at the end of the 12, further 12 weeks of re induction dosing went into the maintenance study. Uh, and importantly, this is the first Crohn study that has included as co-primary endpoints, both clinical endpoints, clinical remission, but also endoscopic endpoints, endoscopic response. Uh, and we're gonna go through some of the data now. So this first uh, was looking at the uh, co-primary endpoint of remission uh, in the motivate. So this is a uh, biologic, uh, 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 exposed patients. And in this group of patients, you can see a, a significant benefit over and above placebo at both doses. Slightly confusingly, uh, for this trial, because of issues with US and European regulators, there are two clinical definitions. I don't think we need to focus too much on that. Uh, but there was also uh, quite a nice endoscopic uh, uh, a definition, centrally read endoscopy, and again, a very clear placebo, perhaps a signal that the higher dose uh, drove more people into endoscopic response, <clears throat> which by the way, was a 50% decrease in SESCD uh, from baseline. Can, can I just quickly interrupt? Do you, do you want to just flip back one slide, sorry? Um, again, you know, a little bit like in Sea View, uh, but a very different population here. These are pretty impressive. Uh, clinical uh, clinical response, at, but don't forget this is, is week 12. But it's remission. Oh, sorry, yes, remission. Rem but don't forget this is week 12. So a lot of the original phase three trials that we looked at had week six and week eight as their primary endpoint. This is week 12, it's taken it a little bit further. But tough population, tough population, and a very low placebo rate, given that it's a 12 week endpoint. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and again, like with the Erstekinumab data, you begin to see the benefit of the higher dose when you get to the harder uh, uh, endpoints here endoscopic response. Uh, you can see perhaps. Uh, a, a delta of 23 versus 17 over and above the placebo. And now we're looking in this in this biologic exposed population, what the difference was if they'd just failed one biologic on the left, or if they'd failed one or uh, greater than one biologic, like two or more biologics uh, on uh, the right hand of each graph. And again, these two definitions, doesn't matter what the definitions are, uh, but clinical remission. And you can see, yes, of course, as you would expect, those patients who'd failed more than one biologic had a, 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 a reduction in the delta above placebo, but still a, a, a good delta and still a significant delta. And compared with other, you know, other trials, other registration trials, where you're looking at this sort of thing, I, I, I'm impressed. Uh, yeah, I think it's impressive data. I, I'm going to say again, it is at week 12. And of course, that does allow a few more people to have met that criteria. But then again, we come to the endoscopic data. And this again, endoscopic response at week 12, drop of the SESCD by 50% in nearly uh, just under half the patients who'd failed one biologic and about a quarter of the patients who'd failed two or more biologics. The sort of same message coming through, but really nice, robust uh, assessment, centrally read endoscopy. This then is looking at the speed of response. So on the left, we've got advanced, which if you remember, uh, uh, included both bio-naive and bio-inadequate uh, responding patients, motivate, just biologic inadequate responders. Uh, and you can see that you begin to see a separation uh, of significance at week four, which obviously increases over time. Uh, and this, uh, just to remind you, this is response, not remission. Uh, and therefore, that's why you're seeing that the, the higher levels of 60%. But actually, interestingly, yeah. it's not <laughs> that much higher. And at so, week eight. Yeah, uh, and as well, the other yeah. thing is, you're seeing this at week eight. So you're yeah. quite right. You get to week 12 to get to where you want to get to. But, you know, you look over in Motivate and these are the tough patients. You've got everything in the bag by week eight. Yeah, this is true, actually. That is true. And of course, I, I 
I don't have the data on remission at week eight no. to show you whether that was no. as good. Fair enough. Uh, and that one wouldn't necessarily expect the endoscopic data to be as good at week eight. No. Now, this is a little bit of, of, of a niche uh, point, but um, obviously the way that the trials work, both advance and motivate those uh, uh, induction studies at the end of week 12, if you were a responder at week 12, you went in to fortify the maintenance study, uh, and we're going to listen to Marla telling us a little bit about that in just a moment. But if you were not a responder at week 12, you were able to be randomized to, again, one of three doses of, uh, of risinkizumab. These are uh, uh, 180, 360, and 1200, and then you were reassessed after a further 12 weeks. And so what this study is showing is what's the additional benefit of another 12 weeks treatment in those who don't meet response criteria at week 12. Uh, and, and what you can see, and, and, and I think you've got to remember the numbers here are small, is what you can see is you do capture a few more people. Slightly bizarrely, the higher dose uh, week 12, 24 dosing seems to do less well than the lower dose, but I suspect that's just a statistical thing. These are the clinical endpoints suggesting that you capture somewhere between a quarter and a half of those inadequate responders, and the endoscopic data pretty much supporting that, that you capture somewhere between a third and a, well, a, bit third and a bit more than a third, uh, uh, irrespective of the dose. Uh, showing that there might be benefit of ongoing treatment in those who've had a little bit of benefit but haven't quite got completely better by week 12. In terms of side effects, uh, this is obviously really important, but uh, the message here is that there's a, 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 a no additional safety concerns over and above that was seen in the induction studies. So I think if we have uh, any joy, we're now going to be able to nip across to uh, Marla who is going to tell us, I'm sure this is the right person, who is going to be telling us, <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is the right person, uh, about the maintenance trial. Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Dubinsky from the Icon School of Medicine, and I'm pleased to be presenting today the abstract entitled Efficacy and Safety of Rizinkizumab as Maintenance Therapy in Patients with Crohn's Disease, the 52-week results from the Phase 3 Fortify study. This was presented at ACG by myself, and at uh, UEGW by uh, our colleague, Dr. Mark Ferrante. As we will speak about the design of Fortify, which is that 52 week maintenance study that we're going to be seeing the results for in just a moment, I did want to explain a little bit about the two induction studies that then led to or fed into Fortify. As a reminder, there were two studies, Advanced, which had a mixed population of biologic exposed uh, as well as non-biologic exposed patients. And uh, in the biologic, it would be inadequate responders. And MOTIVATE, which is the second 12-week uh, induction study, was all patients who were inadequate responders to biologics. Responders at week 12 of the two induction studies were then re-randomized to either Rizinkizumab 360 milligrams sub-Q every eight weeks, Rizinkizumab 180 milligrams sub-Q every eight weeks, and then the group of patients who were in what, the placebo arm, which were getting placebo subcutaneous injections every eight week, and we call that the withdrawal arm because they did all get drug in induction, and only those responders were re-randomized. Again, the co-primary endpoint was at week 52 and included both clinical remission as well as endoscopic remission. Here's some baseline characteristics, and not to go into too much of the detail, but I do want to highlight a couple of really important things as you think about the type of patients you'll be using these therapies in once they are approved. As we typically see in phase three trials, the disease duration of patients that entered into Fortify um, were patients who had had almost 10 years of disease before they were exposed um, <laughs> to this um, new target. Also, when it can't, comes to biologic failure, you can see here that only a quarter across um, the studies actually had not been exposed to biologic. And then you could see that there was almost 40% of patients in the placebo arm, as well as over 45% in the 180 and 36% who had seen at least um, more than one biologic, which means at least two. So this is definitely a population that we're going to be seeing when this drug gets approved in terms of determining who are patients that were actually studied in the trial. You also see here 
that the median calprotectin level, um, which was also calculated baseline, as well as the CRP. So I think it is important for us to understand um, patient population when we think about, as I noted, the next day after it's approved when you want to use it um, for your patients. So let's get into the code primary endpoints in week 52. In the United States, the actual endpoint of clinical remission was indeed the Crohn's disease activity index. In the non-US population studied, it was the stool frequency and abdominal pain score clinical remission definition. For both US and non-US sites, endoscopic response was defined the same. So let's start with the CDAI clinical remission and what you can see here, that both arms met statistical significance compared to placebo at week 52. Also in the stool frequency abdominal pain score, um, clinical remission, which is the non-US sites, you can see here actually that only the 360 milligram, the higher dose, actually met statistical significance. It is worth noting that, yes, the placebo rates are quite high. One thing to remember about this drug class is that the half-life of the drug is close to 28 days, and it typically takes about five half-lives for drugs to be cleared from the body. So all patients in Fortify did get exposed to drug for 12 weeks. So this actually shows you something similar we actually saw with the IL-1223 with ustekinumab, that there's a prolonged um, response in even the placebo group. Now, when it came to endoscopic response, both the 360 and the 180 met the p-value significance compared to placebo. When you actually looked at deeper remission endpoints, meaning endoscopic remission, I just showed you endoscopic response, which was defined by a change in CDAI score, for um, sorry, a change in the SCSCD score. Here, what I'm showing you is pure endoscopic remission, which is defined here on the slide, SCSCD score less than or equal to four, and at least a two-point reduction versus baseline, and no subscore greater than one in any individual variable, as scored by essential reviewer. Deep remission, which was CDAI deep remission, was both a CDAI remission less than 150 and endoscopic remission. And what you can see here compared to baseline uh, at, uh, entry at entry into Fortify, into Fortify what, you can, what see you can see is that is patients, that patients um, definitively, um, definitively did better, did better than, better than when they were when randomized to the placebo arm um, and continue to improve out to week 52 with both dosing arms. However, we start to see a separation in terms of the 360 milligram dosing appearing to have a, a higher um, percentage of, of effect or response in this, in this particular endpoint. End point. I'm gonna break more of that. Um, uh, uh, really, really interesting data, but I'm just gonna show you a couple of little bits and bobs uh, that I wanted to show you from the trial. I think she's highlighted the main clinical points. Uh, really important to note that this is not a real true placebo response. This is induction treatment for 12 weeks and then withdrawal. Uh, and the importance of this is shown in this slide here, which is looking at the impact of drug uh, on a biomarker of, uh, of anti-P9 activity, which is serum IL-22 levels. And what you can see is that Obviously, uh, all patients would receive drug at induction, uh, and therefore their IL-22 levels fall. Uh, for maintenance, for the two people who had the two uh, groups that had drug, you can see their IL-22 levels continue to fall, and these are the placebo. So what you're seeing here is the gradual recovery of IL-22 levels over time, but really it goes nothing like back to baseline by week 52, which is why you're seeing those those high uh, placebo uh, rates. Um, I uh, think we're now going to move on to uh, JAK inhibitors. Uh, don't forget that if you've got any questions, uh, do put them into the chat box. Uh, and if you wanted to see the rest of the video or any of the other videos that were shown, they will be available. The links will be emailed to you afterwards. Pete, it's over to you. Okay, so uh, so thanks, James. I, I, I'm probably not going to go uh, into uh, the uh, depths of this slide too much, uh, other than in fact, I think I'll, uh, you've probably all seen the top half of the slide before, and what it basically tells us, of course, is that the three, uh, the three jacks, jack one, jack two, jack three, and uh, and tick two, that's four, uh, uh, make up uh, different combinations uh, uh, to uh, uh, to interact with different cytokines and derive different inflammatory pathways with different sort of 
uh, immune responsibilities, if you like, um, uh, across a whole range. And of course, the inhibitors that we have available to us are less or more specific in their inhibition of those different jacks. And the one that we're most familiar with, that's tofacitinib, is a pan-jack inhibitor, probably uh, inhibiting jacks one and three more than anything. And as you can see from this slide, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about two others that you're probably familiar with. That's paracetinib and filgotinib, which are JAK1 inhibitors. Uh, and then uh, hopefully James is going to get on to uh, a JAK3 specific uh, uh, in inhibitor, uh, ritlacitinib, uh, and a TIC2, uh, brepacitinib. Uh, so, so we'll be talking about those uh, over the coming few moments. Thank you, James. Uh, tofacitinib. Uh, uh, this, of course, is a drug that we've had available to us for quite some time now. And as ever, as we move into the sort of uh, the real world and the uh, uh, and, and into the post-marketing studies, then we start to get more information about it that helps us to understand our clinical practice. Let's just remember uh, the Octave program, which we can see here, two identical induction program, uh, two in identical induction studies, octave one and octave two, 10 milligrams of tofacitinib BD uh, for eight weeks versus placebo. And then as we're very familiar with, and as we've mentioned already tonight, responders were re-randomized to show that maintenance was necessary in either 10 BD, 5 BD or placebo. Uh, and then uh, there uh, was an open label extension called octave open, uh, in which patients who weren't in remission went on to 10 milligrams BD and those in remission went on to 5 milligrams BD and in fact there was an opportunity to dose escalate within, uh, uh, within Octave Open. So we're going to look at some of the sub-analyses from these studies that maybe help us to understand a few bits and pieces. Uh, so this is the first one uh, and this is looking at some patient reported outcome measures uh, and there's a couple of things that I think are of interest here. So what you can see along uh, the top half uh, of the slide here is a number of patient reported outcome measures. So there's uh, RBS, rectal bleeding score, uh, there's the stool frequency score, and then there's two different measures of the stool frequency score that's less than or equal to one or zero. So let's start with the rectal bleeding score. And I think what we see here uh, is that at time point zero, when patients are going from the induction study into the maintenance study, not surprisingly, most of the patients have a rectal bleeding subscore of zero because they're doing well, otherwise they wouldn't be re-randomized. And then what we see, of course, is that the majority of them who receive placebo, that's the dark blue bar there, have relapsed. By week 52, uh, uh, most of the patients who are on tofacitinib are still uh, uh, experiencing no rectal blood loss, a little bit better with 10 BD than 5 BD. Uh, if you then go on to stool frequency of less than or equal to one, now that's not a stool frequency score of less than, it's not, that's not going to the toilet just once a day. That is, of course, the Mayo score and the Mayo subscore of one on stool frequency is an increase above your usual stool frequency of one to two. Indeed, one to two. Uh, uh, and, and you can see here, again, the majority of patients will have hit that uh, at baseline uh, of maintenance. and just like you see with rectal bleeding, uh, in fact, many of them uh, have, uh, have relapsed in the arm and a few in the treatment arm. But I'm going to take you on. I, see, I think what's interesting about this is, is this next thing, and that's the SFS, the stool frequency score and the Mayo score of zero. In other words, you've returned to baseline, and almost nobody returns to baseline, okay? And I think that tells us actually something about ulcerative colitis itself, and that, in fact, what we see is that even when you're doing really well, because let's face it, if your rectal bleeding's gone away, you're probably doing pretty well. Still, your stool frequency often doesn't go back to normal. Uh, and indeed, even when, if you look here, um, uh, it, there's been absolutely no change in the tofacitinib treated patients in that stool frequency score of zero uh, from, uh, from baseline to maintenance. So I, I think it tells us some, a, a little bit, uh, interestingly, about stool yeah. frequency in patients with I mean, UC. I mean, patients, you know, this is stool frequency back to prior to the diagnosis. So yeah. what it's telling us is that the inflammation associated with UC, the lack of compliance, probably in the distal colon, yeah. drives a non-inflammatory stool frequency. 
I suspect, I, I think that's it, rather than actually the drug not putting you into complete remission. Um, I, I'm probably not going to spend too much time on here. Uh, just if you look uh, at the left hand side, this is one of those persistency type things looking at uh, patients in Octivovum. So they've already had uh, they uh, up to a year of treatment. They might have got into octave open early because they either lost response or failed to respond to induction. But basically, these are some patients who are out to two years, and we're generally seeing them do pretty well. There's some loss of response over time, depending on which measure of response you have. But if we go, uh, if we go on to the next slide, uh, 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 thanks very much. I think this is where we start to see some things that might help us a little bit in clinical practice. So. Again, it's going to take a little bit of explaining, and I, I'm sorry about this. Look over on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, and what you can see here is the dose that the patients were on uh, in octave sustain, okay? So these are patients who were re-randomized, having responded to five milligrams twice a day in the maintenance study, and then the top half here are the patients who have done well in that study, and therefore, in the open-label extension, stay on five milligrams BD. So they're in remission, okay? So patients who've had basically eight weeks induction at 10 BD and then have been on five ever since, and they're going into open label on five ever since. Compare those with the patients at the bottom of the, uh, 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 of the screen. These are patients who've been on 10 BD for a year or so and have continued to do well, and so their dose reduced to five, all right? And I think what this is telling us, if you look at the graphs here, looking at endoscopic improvement, looking at remission, looking at clinical response, there's not much difference between those two different cohorts of patients, all right? So if you're doing well and you dose reduce, you're probably going to do pretty well in the longer term as well, okay? And it tells us that dose reduction is an appropriate thing to do. Which, of course, we ought to be aiming to do because of the issues with safety. Uh, at the higher doses, the, the demonstrable increased risk of zoster, for example, perhaps not melanoma skin cancer. Right, okay. But what happens if you do flare? Of course, that's extremely important as well, and that is what we're looking at here. And these are the patients who have, uh, uh, who have flared after uh, reducing from 10 to 5 and then go back up to 10. And the answer is, that most of them recapture response. Now, it's not shown on this slide, but I can tell you that, uh, 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 that most of them actually do it by month two. Uh, and it, again, the, the trouble with these analyses is when you look at an as-observed population, whereas uh, looking toward, uh, uh, comparing that with non-responder imputation, then you get two quite different curves, and the truth is probably somewhere in between. Yeah. But again, what I think this tells us is you will recapture response in many patients, and in fact, that that response will last over time. Uh, and then, of course, you've mentioned safety. Um, I, I think the safety of tofacitinib is, is actually a whole webinar in itself, and it's an interesting one. And, and I do worry that there's a very great danger of throwing out the baby with the bathwater uh, when it comes to, uh, to, it comes to uh, uh, not using tofacitinib. Uh, because of side effects. It does have a side effect profile. You mentioned zoster. There is absolutely no doubt, particularly at the 10 BD dose, you're more likely to see zoster. These actually are patients at the 5 BD dose. Uh, and of course, we do see a, a slight increased risk in zoster. There's a, a little bit of a, uh, a, 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 a marker here for non-melanoma skin, skin cancer, uh, albeit with very small numbers, possibly with other malignancies as well. But no, there's no DVT or PE signal here. Uh, in, the, uh, in the open label uh, extension, we did see DVTs and PEs, but only at the 10 milligram BD dose, and importantly, only in patients who had pre-existing risk factors so for I DVT guess and PE. What, what this is telling us is that if someone's on long-term five milligram, um, they don't actually have much of an increased DVTP risk, according to this data. It's, it's the ones on higher doses or the ones who took the higher doses when they had active disease who might have the increased risk. Yeah, uh, but not as much of an increased risk as the patients with active disease who aren't treated properly. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I, yeah, no. That's the important message. So I'm now going to take us on to a little bit about upatacitinib. So uh, Pete mentioned tofacitinib is a pan-jack inhibitor. 
upatacid nib is selective to JAK1. And as you can see listed down here, we're going to go through a whole variety of, of, of different uh, ab, uh, abstracts on this, uh, and I'm going to run through quite quickly. Um, so just again, like, like uh, many of the uh, trials, there are two identical uh, induction studies, you achieve and you accomplish, uh, and uh, the primary endpoint was uh, remission, uh, and don't forget this is an ulcerative colitis, was remission uh, at week eight. Uh, those who responded uh, went into the maintenance trial, uh, and those that did not respond, like with the Rizinkizumab trial I showed you before, were able to enter an additional uh, eight weeks of UPA 45 milligrams, and again, then at the end of week 16, so two eight-week periods of induction, the responders went into the uh, randomized maintenance trial. And this included, as one would expect, moderate to severely active uh, disease with uh, an endoscopic subscore of at least two or three, uh, and a mixed population of bio-naive and bioresponders. And actually looking at this, we're going to move straight to Remo, who's going to tell us a little bit about this. Uh, and then once we've had a bit of Remo, I'll just come and highlight some of the issues that I think are really key here. Well, let's see if we can kick him off. So to speak. As it were. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Remo Panaccioni, uh, Professor of Medicine and Director of the IBD Clinic at the University of Calgary. And it's my pleasure to present uh, the data from the Upadacidinib Development Program in Moderate to Severe Ulcerative Colitis. As you know, Upadacidinib is a selective jack one inhibitor that's being looked at in a variety of immune-mediated diseases, including ulcerative colitis. The phase three trial design is in front of you. It consisted of two identical induction studies called You Achieve and You Accomplished, where patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis were randomized either to receive opatacidinib 45 milligrams once daily or placebo. Uh, the patients were randomized in a two to one fashion, and the primary endpoint was clinical remission by the adapted Mayo score at week eight. Patients who responded during the induction study were eligible for the maintenance phase of the program, in which patients were randomized in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one fashion to either two doses of apatacidinib, 35 milligrams once daily, or 15 milligrams once daily, or to placebo, with the primary endpoint once again being clinical remission by the adapted Mayo score at week 52. So just to give you an idea of the type of patients that came into this trial with moderate to severe ulcerative uh, colitis, uh, you can see what we're highlighting here is that approximately half of the patients had been exposed to biologic therapy with a number of the patients being exposed to more than one biologic therapy. And if we think about uh, the adapted Mayo score and severity, about 40% of the patients had an adapted Mayo score of greater than seven, which is more on the severe end uh, of the spectrum. Now, if we look at the results, uh, on the left-hand side here, we're showing uh, the results in the induction studies, both you achieve and you accomplish. And you can see for the primary endpoint, 26% uh, and 33% in the two studies with deltas of 22% and 29% over placebo. These are highly statistically significant. If we look in the patients who responded or randomized into the two doses in the maintenance, you can see that uh, the Clinical remission was 42% in the 15 milligram once daily dosing, and it was 52% in the 30 milligram once daily dosing, giving us deltas of 30 and 40% respectively, and again, highly statistically significant. What was noted in this program is that uh, patients who did uh, respond during the induction uh, study responded quite quickly with statistically significant differences over placebo in a pre-specified analysis as early as uh, week two. And in the maintenance therapy, I already showed you the clinical remission, the primary endpoint on the far left-hand side, but these are a host of ranked secondary endpoints, including endoscopic improvement, maintenance of clinical remission, which means you're in remission at week eight and then week 52, steroid-free remission, and all the way over to sort of the endoscopic and more objective measures, including a new measure 
histoendoscopic mucosal improvement on the far right hand side here where you can see in the uh, 30 milligram dose uh, dosing group almost half of the patients had a Mayo endoscopy score of zero or one and were in histological remission so very robust outcomes as far as safety, uh, there are some uh, concerns with safety with the JAK class uh, based on our experience with tofacitinib and the oral surveillance. The most common AEs were elevations in uh, the CK amongst the uh, patacitinib groups, uh, but overall it was quite uh, it was quite well tolerated. Uh, there was a signal for herpes zoster, which we've seen within the JAK class, and there were two cases of venous thromboembolism, uh, which in uh, the group in the uh, efficacy group analysis. So what are the potential implications of these data to clinical practice, uh, which is probably the most important questions? Well, as I showed you, uh, for induction and maintenance, uh, patacidinib had significantly greater efficacy compared to placebo for all the primary and secondary endpoints over a year. These include impressive effect sizes in clinical, endoscopic, and histological evaluations. Um, I think selective JAK inhibition uh, has the ability to transform the, we, the way we do treat moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. It's rapid in its effect, it's highly effective overall, it's oral, it's non-immunogenic, and then therefore it gives us a long-term option. Ultimately, positioning, positioning, will, be positioning will be decided by healthcare by providers, providers and their patients and, and perhaps by regulatory agencies. Uh, those, thank you for allowing me to present these data and uh, I wish you a great meeting. So we're gonna finish uh, with Remo there and just go a little back to my screen. I just had a few little bits and bobs I wanted to highlight from some of the other uh, data that came out, but Remo's really nicely presented there the uh, induction and maintenance doses. Here's just a couple of points that I think to make. Firstly, uh, it works quite quickly. This is week two data, drug versus placebo. I think we can all see straight across, irrespective of what endpoint you use, drug works quickly. Uh, the next uh, was uh, the uh, impact in terms of objective markers of inflammation. It lowers your uh, CalPro uh, uh, across both uh, induction studies. Uh, and these are the data that Remo has showed you. So I'm not going to uh, focus on that. This is nice. Uh, Pete showed you some fatigue data uh, earlier on. Uh, and this is some uh, fatigue data with upatacitinib, and you can see compared to placebo, using significant improvement in facet F scores achieved by uh, significantly more patients with upa than placebo. Again, showing if you get people better, you improve some of the non-inflammatory symptoms. I, I want to, I want to know how much less tired do I feel if my facet F goes up 9.5 points? Yeah, I, it's it's a, it's an unusual it's an unusual uh, way, and and they're using the least squares mean. Uh, change from baseline. So, so uh, it, it, this is, my understanding is this is considered to be a significant benefit, but I have to be honest and say, uh, I'm not 100% sure I can explain that. And also here, I think looking at a, a symptom that's really important mm. to our patients uh, is reduction in bowel urgency. So this was a, a separate PRO that was included in the two induction trials. And you can see it seems to reduce urgency quite quickly. Remo touched on side effects, so I'm not going to go on to that. And he also went through the maintenance data, uh, and I'm not going to go through uh, that. But look at this here, 70% uh, maintenance of endoscopic improvement. Uh, this is some of the best data that we've seen uh, from a uh, 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 any agent in a randomized controlled trial in inflammatory bowel disease, I would say. And uh, and, and safety wise, yeah, safety because, wise. Know, I mean, Remo touched on that. Yeah. A few things that you'll notice: um, patients do get an elevation in CK, uh, and that seems to be dose dependent. Uh, they do get a, uh, a mild lymphopenia, and then when we go to the adverse events of special interest, there wasn't really a signal for thromboembolic events. Yes, there were there were uh, a very few. Uh, in the higher dose treatment, uh, there was a little bit of zoster, but only only a very little bit of zoster. But obviously, it was more in the treatment group than the than the placebo group. So I think I think it would be fair to say that that it's not a drug without any side effects, but it seems to have 
a very acceptable side effect profile. Whether it has a more favorable safety profile than tofacitinib, I think it's a little bit tricky to say yeah. based upon the data that we currently have, because we're sort of then comparing the wealth of data we've got with the uh, real world use of tofacitinib with the very controlled data from a trial. I think it would be a slightly unfair comparison. It certainly doesn't seem to have a worse safety profile and might have a slightly better safety profile. Um, before we um, before we move on to uh, another JAK inhibitor, there was a question here from Louise about is the oral contraceptive pill a risk factor for thromboembolic disease? She was talking about tofacitinib, but I'm guessing uh, uh, the same for any of the JAK inhibitors. It's certainly said to be the combined pillars anyway, and, uh, and so changing people onto a progesterone-only pill or indeed uh, another form of contraception uh, is one way of dealing with that. Uh, and then there's a question about the elevated CK is what you have to do about it. The honest answer, when we've had patients who've had significantly elevated CKs, we've just carried them on drug and what you tend to see, it tends to go up and then it stabilizes and then over time it falls down again. Um, so, so I think you do see it uh, in the absence of symptoms of, of myositis. Uh, I've not stopped the drug, either TOFA or UPA in the clinical trials. Uh, and I think now we're going to move on to a section that Pete is doing on filgotinib. Okay, so on to another uh, 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 JAK1 specific uh, uh, inhibitor. Uh, we've seen the selection data before. And again, I'm just going to remind you about the, uh, the study design. You can see it here. Now, it's a little bit different because it's, um, uh, it's two sort of uh, uh, two doses of filgotinib. That's 200 and 100. Uh, and then you do re-randomize the responders to uh, 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 after induction in the maintenance arm, but you could only get re-randomized either to placebo or to the dose that you were taking during induction. So you couldn't either go 200 to 100 or 100 to 200. It was sort of like you, you stayed on the same dose. And it's slightly, in some ways, uh, it's slightly disappointing. And two uh, induction studies, and again, note here, they're not identical in uh, in terms of the cohorts going in because they have the biologic naive and biologic experience but they are of course identical in terms of uh, uh of design and then as a maintenance study and an open label uh, extension now uh, iris has appeared on screen uh, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the difference between the patients who have received uh, different drugs going into uh, selection so james is just very cleverly switching over to video again. We will only have a little bit of it. Hello, I'm Iris Dotan from the Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva, Israel. And it's a great pleasure to present to you an abstract that we recently presented during the last UHW, which was held in hybrid mode. Uh, hopefully all of us will be able to meet next year face to face. So the abstract we presented uh, was entitled Efficacy of Filgotinib in Patients with Ulcerative Colitis by Line of Therapy in the Phase 2B3 Selection Trial. And I'm presenting on behalf of all authors. And as we all know, there is a high proportion of patients with ulcerative colitis who do not respond to treatment or they lose response over time. Thus, many of them switch between different therapies which have different mechanisms of action. And recently, we're fortunate to have new mechanisms of actions, specifically the gynus kinase inhibitors, and filgotinib is a once daily oral gynus kinase 1 preferential inhibitor. So in the phase 2B3 selection trial that was recently published, filgotinib 200 milligrams was well tolerated and efficacious in patients with ulcerative colitis in inducing and maintaining remission versus placebo. So in these uh, post-hoc analysis that we are presenting now, we aim actually to assess the efficacy of filgotinib in inducing and maintaining clinical remission and Mayo Clinic score response in patients who are biologic naive and biologic experienced. And in the biologic experienced group, we wanted to see what will be the effect in patients who failed one or two or more biologics or one or two mechanisms of action, which will be anti-TNF-alpha uh, inhibitors and vedolizumab. 
So as uh, you all remember, the selection 2B3 double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial uh, included patients who are adults with moderately uh, to severely active ulcerative colitis that had evidence of ulcerative colitis by endoscopy and histopathology for over six months. So the diagnosis had to be at least six months uh, before enrollment. And there, of course, uh, clinical activity was assessed by the Mayo score and total Mayo clinic score of 6 uh, to 12 points, including Mayo endoscopic subscore of 2 or more, rectal bleeding subscore of 1 or more, stool frequency score of 1 or more, and physician global assessment of 2 or more. Now, this is the study design, and patients were included in an, two induction studies and a maintenance study. So the induction studies were for 10 weeks. You can see them here, uh, where patients were uh, enrolled on a two to two to one basis to receive either filgotinib 200 milligrams once daily or filgotinib 100 milligrams once daily or placebo once daily and they were included as a biologic naive or biologic experienced patients, and uh, that was study induction A and B respectively. So after 10 weeks of treatment, patients who were responders, mm -hmm. uh, whether they responded to active drug or to placebo, they were entitled to be included in a maintenance study uh, until week 58. Now, the eligibility, as we said, for the maintenance study was completion of induction A or B in clinical remission or Mayo Clinic score response. And the, uh, you can see the uh, definitions of clinical remission and Mayo Clinic score response uh, in your slide. So this is an important outcome slide. This is the proportion of patients in clinical remission at week 10. As you can see on your left-hand side, Filgotinib 200 milligrams were, was effective in inducing clinical remission at week 10 in patients who are biologic naive and biologic experienced. On your right hand side, you see the biologic experienced patients in, and here a larger treatment effect was observed in patients with failure of one biologic or one mechanisms of action than in those with failure of multiple biologics or multiple mechanisms of action. Similarly, the proportions of patients in Mayo Clinic score response at week 10 are presented here. And here, what you can see, again, on your left-hand side, you can see that filgotinib 200 milligrams was efficacious in inducing Mayo Clinic score response at week 10 in biologic naive and biologic experienced patients. And in the biologic experience patients, in patients with failure of one or two or more biologics or one or two mechanisms of action. When we're moving to the maintenance outcomes, to the week 58 clinical remission, there were higher proportions of patients uh, that were uh, biologic naive or biologic experience responders and biologic experienced responders with failure of two or more biologics or two mechanisms of action that were treated with maintenance of 200 milligrams versus placebo that were in clinical remission at week 58. And here we are showing the Mayo Clinic score response at week 58. Here we see that higher proportion of responders in all patient groups and subgroups that were treated with maintenance filgotinib 200 milligrams versus placebo were in Mayo Clinic score response at week 58. So to summarize, we can see that higher proportion of biologic naive and experienced patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis that were treated with filgotinib 200 milligrams versus placebo achieved clinical remission and vision Mayo and Clinic score response at week 10 and 58. And 58. Now, the induction now the induction result. Uh, and Pete is going to summarize because I suspect he'll do it very succinctly. And there we go. Lovely. And uh, again, just to remind you, you can watch the end of, uh, uh, of Iris if, uh, if you want to. The videos are all available to you. I'm just going to uh, 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 just show you a, a couple of of other outcomes. Uh, before I do that, I think you know James and I were just discussing that there's clearly the 200 dose appears to be the more effective dose. So what's slightly disappointed with the trial design, and in contrast to the uh, to the TOFA trials, 
is that what you didn't get was that 200 induction 100 maintenance yeah. uh, arm which would have been interesting uh, uh, because that dose flexibility jack inhibitors clearly have a, uh, a a dose response relationship for efficacy and they clearly have one for side effects as well it's not like using a biology so that would have been useful but it isn't there um, it, these data here are simply uh, the induction non-responders receiving a further uh, uh, period of time uh, on uh, uh, on filgotinib for induction either at 200 uh, uh, or 100 uh, or indeed uh, uh, placebo and you can see uh, that you will recapture uh, some of those not recapture you will capture an additional proportion of patients in those uh, in those studies uh, and this is a, a, one of those graphs again that looks at the uh, at how well you maintain remission over time uh, and again it, the colors are not particularly helpful here are they i'm sorry about that but i think what you can see clearly is that if you look at the 200 arm which is at the top there the dark arm it seems to be doing better uh, than the 100 arm which is the uh, the slightly paler one just below and the two placebo arms uh, which are below that so you know uh, as we just mentioned 200 appears to be better than 100. Uh, so finally in jack inhibitors i'm going to hand back to james who's going to talk about two Others. So I'm going to be very quick with this because this is a phase uh, uh, two design, really. The, the, the nice thing about this is it's what's called an umbrella study. And that means you try two agents uh, against a common placebo. So, so you're able to uh, uh, get more uh, outcomes uh, using fewer patients uh, because you pool the placebo group uh, against both. And, and this effectively is an induction trial of three different doses of uh, those two alternative uh, uh, um, uh, JAK inhibitors, the uh, anti-JAK3 and the anti-TIC2 inhibitors. And, and what you can see within this uh, umbrella trial, as I say, the placebo response here almost, well, it is zero, uh, really for the first time managing to hammer down uh, a placebo response to almost zero, and, and that comes from being very rigorous in the groups of patients included. These are uh, um, uh, 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 centrally red uh, outcomes, and you can see for both agents a really nice dose response, both in terms of clinical remission, but also here in terms of endoscopic improvement, uh, which you know uh, for for the dr both drugs, uh, I think is very promising for their future. Uh, exploration in phase three trials uh, and there weren't uh, significant safety concerns and I think with that I'm going to pass on to Peter just check about any questions nothing there don't forget you can type questions into the chat box and Pete's going to talk a little bit about the updated data from uh, the uh, uh, Ozanimod trials so uh, just to remind you James has already told us about uh, S1P gradients uh, and the ability to interfere uh, to modulate S1P receptors um, uh, uh, on uh, on immune cells and therefore affect their egress uh, from lymph nodes, and of course, um, uh, 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 Xanamod interferes with that um, a little bit. Like Jax, it's not just uh, one S1P receptor, but there are five S1P1 through to five, and Xanamod uh, chiefly uh, modulates S1P1 and S1P5. Uh, which is uh, uh, how, in part, it uh, has its effects within the central nervous system. And indeed, I think fingolimod is another another S1P, S1P one uh, uh, five receptor modulator. Anyway, uh, so uh, so these are the S one P receptor modulators. We'll hear more about others in the future, but we're interested today uh, in Zanimod. Oh, what am I doing there? Oh, showing everyone my diary. Oh, I wonder Let's what you're up to. Let's we could look at that, that again. That might be fun. And let's move on to the data. <laughs> <laughs> what am I pressing now? There we go. Uh, so here's the study design. Again, slightly different. They're always just slightly different from each other, aren't they? Um, so what we've got here is an induction study. So that's the sort of the top two bars, if you like. Cohort one, randomized to either placebo or to azanamod, effectively one gram, um, uh, with randomization of the responders. And then you'll see this cohort two. And this is an open label study. And basically what that is doing, and we've seen this before, I'm struggling to remember where we saw it, but uh, but I'll think about it as I talk. Uh, but this is basically boosting the number of patients 
who you put into the re-randomization of the responders. Of course, they're open label, uh, so you then start having to think about what placebo response you may get there. Uh, and of course, as nearly always in these studies, we see that non-responders and indeed dropouts in the maintenance arm can go into an open label extension. Uh, so, uh, what's interesting here uh, is that we're looking at some of the responses in patients who are exposed to different numbers of biologics as they go into the study. So, you can see nicely outlined in different colours, we have biologic naive patients, patients who've received one biologic and patients who have received two biologics. Uh, and you can see that there are reasonable numbers of each of these uh, uh, each of these. Uh, noticeably, uh, not surprisingly perhaps, those patients who were on steroids at the start were more likely to have been exposed to two or more biologics. And that, of course, can warp the results a little bit when we're looking at the patients who are in there because you'll get more corticosteroid patients at the start. Uh, this is uh, a, a summary of the, uh, uh, of the original study that was presented uh, over a year ago at UEGW, and basically it shows that there was uh, uh, an improvement uh, in the uh, primary outcome, that was clinical remission uh, at week 10 in those patients exposed to azanamod, uh, and as we like to see across uh, multiple endpoints to reassure us that these findings are real, azanamod was superior to placebo, and importantly, not just in clinical outcomes, but also in endoscopic outcomes as well. And indeed, when you then look at the re-randomized response cohort, again, uh, you will see that across the endpoints, we see pretty robust improvement of drug-treated patients over placebo-treated patients, 37% of patients being in remission at the end of the maintenance. So that's that's just uh, uh, reminding us uh, of, uh, uh, of the data from the original trial. Here we see some of the data looking at uh, patients cut by their prior biologic use. And what we see along the bottom here is the biologic naive patients, the one biologic exposed patients, and the two plus biologic exposed patients. Uh, the different colors in the blue, that's cohort one and cohort two, okay? So the patients who either went into the uh, placebo control trial or the booster study. Uh, and what you can see here uh, is, that, uh, is, uh, is that clearly patients who've been exposed to two biologics do much worse than patients who've been uh, uh, exposed to one biologic who do a little bit worse than the biologic naive patients. This is induction and maybe that's because it's difficult to get people into remission uh, in 10 weeks, particularly if they're a refractory cohort. But you can see, and again, perhaps unsurprisingly, that response is lower in those patients who are multiple biologic uh, refractory, if you like. Uh, and indeed, it's reflected also in the endoscopic uh, outcomes, both in terms of improvement uh, and in terms of mucosal healing. Uh, and I think this is just backing up what we've seen with some of the uh, other drugs that these refractory patients uh, are probably going to do less well, certainly with this class, as we see with other, uh, uh, with other classes as well. Um, perhaps the one place we don't see such a clear separation is in maintenance. So maybe if you do respond, uh, uh, then, uh, uh, then, then the difference is less clear cut. That's, that's perhaps not so true for remission, but if you look over on the right hand side there, and you look at response, there seems to be less of a difference there. Uh, and, and again, I guess that's just because it's easier to get people to respond to a drug rather than to get them into remission. So, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're a refractory patient, but you've responded to induction and then you carry on on the drug, then you, you, know, you, you perhaps won't have as brilliant a response over time if you're, if you're multiple biologic exposed, but you will still keep that response in some form or another. Uh, so, and I think that's pretty uh, much it. Oh no, uh, uh, similar, uh, we can see it for the endoscopic outcomes as well. Again, it really reflects what we've already seen uh, in the preceding slides, uh, particularly if you're a multiple biologic refractory patient, your mucosa is going to do less well uh, over time uh, than if uh, you are biologic naive. When it comes to safety, there's probably not a lot to see here. What we do see, I'm just going to uh, I'm not sure you can see the cursor. Uh, ALT, so we see abnormal liver function tests in association with Xanamod, but note if you go down to the bottom, we didn't see treatment discontinuation so much. Uh, 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 so I think 
Although we see abnormal LFTs, we don't see that to people having to stop the drug. A little bit like your CK story earlier yeah. on. Uh, so well tolerated, uh, I think it's fair to say. So I'm, I'm going to finish. I think this will be the last abstract we present. We've got about another five, ten minutes to run. Um, and, and I'm going to just show you a trial that for some reason, and I can't work this out, this was not an oral presentation at UEG. This was a poster. But we did sort of find it in the, the sort of, uh, the poster, and this was a, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of vedolizumab uh, plus ciprofloxacin versus ciprofloxacin uh, and placebo uh, for patients with uh, antibiotic-dependent or refractory pouchitis. Uh, and, and it's a really neat trial. I have no idea why it wasn't an oral presentation, uh, but patients with uh, 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 a pouch who'd had uh, at several episodes of pouchitis, at least three within the year before the screening, who had previously uh, been treated with antibiotics or who required continuous antibiotics could enter the trial. They went through a screening phase. They had an endoscopy to assess the degree of pouchitis. They all went on to ciprofloxacin to begin with. And then they received standard induction vedolizumab at weeks 0, 2, and 6, followed by the normal eight weekly maintenance. If they were on steroids at baseline, they had to begin steroid taper uh, uh, between week 4 and week 8. Uh, the primary endpoint was uh, endoscopic. Uh, at um, uh, 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 sorry, endoscopic and clinical uh, at week uh, 14, and then they continued on uh, through the year. Um, and uh, let me just show you the results here. So this is using a pouch disease activity index, which is a this is a modified score. I think we've got. Well, we don't have the definition here, but it's a modified score. It involves both clinical uh, and endoscopic. Uh, markers of inflammation. And what you can see here, uh, this is week 14, so patients had been on Cipro with induction, then came off the Cipro, were tailing off steroids. You can see, really to my mind, quite a clear benefit of vedolizumab over placebo in patients with uh, this antibiotic, uh, uh, or, or, or I guess, uh, frequent antibiotic dependent or, or, or requiring responsive uh, pouchitis. And I think this is really quite impressive data. Certainly yes. it's, it's yeah, it is the first randomized controlled trial of a biologic in pouchitis. We saw the Alica Forsen trial presented at uh, either this year's or last year's UGW, which showed no benefit whatsoever. Uh, but you can see here really nice, uh, this is looking at people who were in remission at week 14 and week 34, so showing a nice uh, maintenance of that benefit. Uh, and I think we're going to finish there. We're not going to show this data because it's a, 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 a trial drug that, that is really only in phase three. So uh, I guess uh, what do we take from this uh, in terms of the, um, the data? I, I have to say my, my highlights, I think, would be the uh, really high uh, remission rates that we saw in CV with both erstikinumab and uh, adalimumab, showing that if we treat patients early, and for me, then it's the Rizinkizumab and UPA data. I think they're amazing. I think that's a really impressive data set. I think uh, uh, what will be really good fun is actually starting to use them. Uh, we've uh, we've got uh, I think nearly 20 patients on Riz now. Uh, so, uh, but we haven't uh, we only treated one with the paracetamol. So, uh, really looking forward to uh, some real world data coming out there. And so with that, uh, Pete, do you have any last thoughts? No, I think just to really once again, thanks to uh, the companies who support this. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, without them, it wouldn't happen. Uh, and thanks to you for coming along and watching and for your support uh, and, uh, and positive feedback in the past. We hope we've done you good this time. OK, and with that, we're going to we're going to finish. Uh, and again. Thank you very much indeed.